Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Historical Humans Podcast. This is episode 28, and we're going to be talking about Stonehenge. My name's Justin Woods, and I'm joined today by my fellow co host Cullum Coleman and Aaron Gilpin. And yeah, today we're taking it prehistoric. We're going, what is this, uh, this Neolithic? Is- yeah, this is going to be Neolithic, and it's not just the Stonehenge that we're going to try and talk about today, but also Newgrange uh, as well. So we get uh, we get a good chunk of the Mesolithic involved as well. Controversial, I love it. It's uh, it's going to be very fun. <laughs> um, in total violation of our name, we have gone to prehistoric humans. So um, I uh, spent many a week raging against this idea in my head because why <laughs> does anyone? <laughs> Want to talk about why we're talking about these monuments uh, at this particular time of the year? Well, the day that we're recording is the shortest day of the year, the winter solstice, December 21st. So, yeah, it is um, it is a great time, and we like to align ourselves with uh, certain dates, and this just kind of fell in our lap. So, you know... Stonehenge and Newgrange both are known for their lunar alignments and their solar positioning. And on the day of the solstice, the sun lines up almost perfectly with certain aspects of these buildings. Yeah. Which, how old are they? All right, so we're going to kick it off here with Stonehenge, which is located on the Salisbury Plain. 13 kilometers north of Salisbury, Witcher, England. So it's just 13 kilometers, a short jaunt into the middle of nowhere. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a common theme of these uh, two monuments that parallel themselves in a lot of ways. <laughs> I mean, it's middle of nowhere now. Probably it, not then. It was, no, it was it definitely was, in the middle no, of it nowhere was the, then. It was the intersection of nowhere back then. <laughs> That's why it was that, important. It it's actually at a crossroads um, from like the for the uh, Neolithic peoples. It's actually at a crossroads between territories. So this is kind of the border post. Yeah, <laughs> so there's the border uh, posts are middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, so funny, funny, uh, funny story about that. With um, I actually got to go to work on a Neolithic site in the UK, and uh, I actually got a really big rundown on some of the latest um ideas and thought processes behind mesolithic and neolithic um thought patterns um but the more the more we get into stonehenge specifically uh i can go on a little bit about that especially when we start talking about the construction process so yeah so to answer our original question here stonehenge was built between the year 3000 and 1520 BCE. It's not uh, the 3000 the Jonas Brothers were talking about. I no, think it is the year 3000. Not I don't even know that song. And I, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not upset by that fact. I am, in fact, really <laughs> glad of that. Uh, if the Jonas Brothers have sound anything like Justin's rendition, I'm very glad of not knowing that song. <laughs> hey, that song is a low key bop, okay? Anyway, uh, like three thousand years old. That's still pretty late. Five thousand. Oh, Five thousand. Yeah. Three yeah. Thir- three thousand to fifteen twenty BCE. So we got to add an extra two K on top of that. That's still pretty late, isn't it? I mean, um, five thousand. That's yeah. Yeah, it is. At it's, least Neolithic Britain. Well, it's it's it is constructed from the ne- from Neolithic England through Bronze Age England. Yeah. Uh, is its construction period it. It is built in six phases that we will get into detail on later. Uh, so there's six intermittent phases of construction, all of which build towards the creation of the uh, final stone henge uh, that I have this little model of that we will be attempting to reference throughout the video because there is some confusing architecture, <laughs> uh, which is surprising given the fact that it's literally man stack stones. <laughs> Multiple times, including recently. Yeah. It's not the first time they tr- they've done this. People were yes, doing yeah, it, it all before Stonehenge. Yep. So yeah, and um, one of the key things to address here right at the beginning is uh, well, actually two key things. Number one, oh, come Stonehenge on. predates uh, the existence of the Celts and therefore the Druids in Britain 
by a minimum of 1,000 years. It is not a Celtic monument. I know it's a very popular uh, mindset in the modern age, but it is decidedly not. This is something far, far older than any Druidic religion. Ooh, controversial. No, history. <laughs> the second thing is that the exact purpose of Stonehenge uh, is unknown. There is a lot of presumed religious significance. However, given its perfect alignment uh, for the entrance to the midsummer sunrise and to its heel stone on the midwinter sunset, which is uh, what we are at today, midwinter, uh, it is possibly believed to have been used to recalibrate calendars for the purposes of farming and seasons, as a lot of times uh, many solar calendars do tend to get out of whack with regards to seasons because people did not understand leap years. We have an entire podcast from last year <laughs> on uh, on this exact phenomenon in our calendars podcast. Someone remember to link that in the video, please. <laughs> but um, that aside, uh, Stonehenge is, uh, is made of uh, some wonderful stones from the... Uh, from the Cenozoic era, which is uh, the last 66 million years of history, uh, called Sarsen Stones. Because we keep naming identical rocks after the places they're found. <laughs> yeah, that's like the secret to geology names, is most times the rocks are just named after the location. It's just easier that way, okay? They change. They, they're not the same everywhere. Yep. Yeah, so they are called Sarsen Stones. They're silified sandstone from southern england and they are done in a simple uh post and lintel formation which is you take two posts you take a lintel across them and you make this lovely little uh classic door frame uh it's as simple as that and by simple i mean you know multi-ton uh boulders <laughs> I think that's where a lot of people start having some doubts with these ancient structures is just the pure scale and capacity. Because not only is it multi-ton rocks, it's positioning, it's lifting, it's getting them to the location. Each one of those is a monumental task. And you think about the lack of technology of those people. It just... it. The, yeah, they're yeah. They are uh, shaping these stones, uh, this sarsen sandstone with sarsen sandstone tools. They are literally beating the rock with smaller versions of the rock <laughs> and shape it into what they want. I will beat um, you with a rock. That is uh, that is, and because they did shape a lot of these rocks to fit together snugly, so they could actually stand up. Yeah, uh, is why the area around Stonehenge is um, more stone than earth. Uh, as it stands, because of all the flakes from the broken tools, from the, you know, hundreds of tons of material, all of that is just shape that happened right on site. They wow. hauled the rock over, they shaped it, they lifted it. I guess it makes sense, you know, site of production, site of erection, like. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is not like Easter Island where they carve it uh, at where the stone is and then move it to its final place. They move the stone to its final place, then they shape it. They did that. The Egyptians did that with their obelisks, too. Yeah. Yeah, because you don't want to work on the obelisk for, you know, months and then have it break in shipping. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, well, there's a lot going here. And uh, there's one other type of stone that gets found here a lot. And these are called blue stones from the Priscelli Hills in southwest Wales. And these small, small stones, these are the small stones on site weigh between two and five tons a piece. These are the these are these are the small rocks here. It is a five ton rock. <laughs> so that should give you some sense of the scale. Each of these stones was transported uh, upwards of a hundred miles or a hundred and sixty kilometers to Stonehenge. And that's and... why I think people start getting kind of afraid of the scale. That's a monumental it's, distance. It is a monumental distance and it is um it is nothing to be skeptical of. This is, this is humanity. We build things. Yeah, uh, we just do almost, we almost compulsively. Yeah, almost compulsively. Uh, also, we just, human in us. Yeah. Also, we talk about like, you know, like the amount, the amount of manpower. 
What we often don't talk about is the amount of convincing people to just go do this. And there's usually a lot of reasons for like why anybody would want to build it. I mean, same thing with the pyramids, you know, people are like, why would anyone want to do this? Because they got paid to do it. Yeah, I'm sure like it's, there's some sort of like if it is a religious reason, religion can we all know religion can motivate people to do lots of things or well yeah. also like just <clears throat> the pure ar archaeology and like anthropology of it of to have people one become specialist in building and construction and carving that shows a specialization of skill and what that usually indicates is an is a food surplus because if you're able to have people not have to worry about gathering food or hunting then they can start specializing in skill. So it's starting to show a more advanced civilization in terms of just specialization and skill sets. So it's kind of a really cool thing because you don't see that very often in hunter gatherer societies to this extent, but it's usually the indication of like pre civilization, like right before yeah. they start settling down. I, I would also like to point out something interesting that I learned while I was in the UK. It's that these mega, cause uh, uh, was constructed in the six stages between, you know, like 3000 BC or whatever. So, like, when I say, like, this is kind of late for Britain, I mean, like, really late because. So, what we've seen, <laughs> what's been noted is megalithic structures start as far north in, like, the earlier parts of Scotland. Or like the upper parts of Scotland, like sort of around Orkney, where you start seeing like the development of these megalithic structures. And the further south you go is when, you know, you see like when you get into like the late Mesolithic, early Neolithic. Mm -hmm. So this is like so when so this being all the way down in Wiltshire, but so obviously there has there's already a tradition. So Stonehenge was like I guess you could consider it a magnum opus in a sense. Of all mesolithic structures, or, or megalithic structures, sorry. Yeah, well, that, that 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 might be, but it also um maybe not because if we jump down, if we want to just get right into the history of the Stonehenge and skip over the little bit of the extra stuff we have around. Uh, so there's evidence that people were working at Stonehenge, doing Stonehenge things as early as 8,000 BC. So the site already had significance. Yeah, well, and it the is. other thing, too, is they've done archaeology and shown that there were a lot of wooden structures that preceded the stone, yeah. the permanents. Yep, that is, yep, that is, uh, that is what begins around 8,000 or 7,000 BC is uh, they begin to dig pits and erect uh, pine posts oh, yeah. uh, within, less than, uh, within less than 200 meters of the modern stone arrangement. So they are... They are using this site, and it is um, fun to note that the Stonehenge site, uh, when they start ma building the wooden version, there's no comparable structure in Northwest Europe at the time they begin to uh, erect things at Stonehenge. So this thing was a flex. This thing, this, this, <laughs> this, it is both the first and the last. <laughs> it is kind of the thing, it's, you know, it's an Alpha Omega almost. Like, they built it, and everyone else was like, well, fuck, we can't top that. Like, we're not even going to try. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it's very unusual for the hunter-gatherers that are in the area at this time to even attempt to build monuments. It's just not something that uh, a largely nomadic culture would do. So the, But they still did it here. So that kind of just adds... Because, again, we all we, we think of Mesolithic as being more mobile. Mm -hmm. So that... So that um, with it being highly unusual, it kind of what makes uh, archaeologists and paleoarchaeologists think about just how sedentary. Maybe it's more of like a semi-pastoral kind of situation. Well, you, you never know, but like you know, there at some point there has to be the dawn of settlement. <laughs> at some point, there has to be the dawn of specialization. We kind of with Stonehenge witness the whole transformation. <laughs> Yeah, which From is really to interesting to see, especially with hunter gatherers. Yeah, and uh, um, one of the uh, one of the wonderful things is uh, 
in the in between from 8,000 to 3,000 where we start getting the proper construction of Stonehenge as we know it. Uh, there's some wonderful, uh, well, I should say interesting bits of activity uh, that begin to take place around uh, the area. Namely, uh, the presence of long burrows in just three miles of Stonehenge, just in that surrounding area. There's 17 long barrows, which are burial mounds, uh, from the Neolithic period, just there in this gap. And uh, there's Cursus monuments, which are similar uh, long enclosures, all from the fourth millennium. There's, there's clearly, this is a place where important things happen. Well, yeah, one, given the date of occupation plus the amount of burials and the yeah. fact that this was a place that nomadic people congregated, it yeah. it's not yeah. a far stretch to say that this was a very significant site, either yeah. ritually or religiously. And mm -hmm. uh, at the point where uh, we get Stonehenge in full swing, so at uh, 2200 to 1700 BCE, um, the River Avon, which is the river neighboring Stonehenge, uh, there's a... Uh, uh, people at that time have switched from long barrows to round barrows. And in just 500 years, there are over a thousand round barrows built on, along the river next to Stonehenge. <laughs> wow. So this, whatever is go whatever significance it had uh, in the Mesolithic and, you know, Neolithic goes even bigger, even grander as the monument itself is aggrandized. I have a question real quick. <clears throat> yeah, go for it. So so in Egyptology, um, there's the debate on, you know, how some of the stone blocks got moved, right? Um, and one of the thoughts was the Nile River actually was closer to where the pyramids were, and they would float some of the rocks down river. Yeah. Do you think they could have did that with some of these stones, or were uh, they just like too heavy? I, I don't think I don't think the uh the Avon River flows into Wales. Okay. Um, however, one of the theories with that is also with water is um, some believe that some of the stones that are used in Stonehenge were moved by Cenozoic uh, ice flows from the Ice Age and got sheared off of Wales and deposited closer to Aver uh, closer to Salisbury. Okay. Well, that, well, that's still interesting. There, 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 there is that theory that a glacier made everything easier for everybody. Alternatively, uh, England Englishmen going into Wales and taking things. Uh, <laughs> also, not, not without historical <laughs> precedence. Down, uh, Irishman, so, so. down. <laughs> Shut up, you're in the same boat as me, you all are. I, I know, but still, that, that's Shut a up. lot of fire. Anyway, anyway, would we like to go into the six stages of construction? Who would like to uh, talk about the, uh, the first couple stages here? Well, I'll do it. Oh, go right ahead. Go I'll go for it. it. I don't get. I don't usually do this part, so I'm kind of yeah, excited. Good. good. I right, don't so want to talk about stones. <laughs> I like stones. Stones are fun. First, okay. So the first stage kind of like dates back to about 3000 BC to about 2935 BCE. Um, the enclosure. It's a circular enclosure, about 330 feet in diameter. Um, the it encircles the 56 pits of the apiary holes. Yep. There is a ditch enclosure, which is flanked on the outside by a high bank and on the inside by a low bank, and there are two entrances. There's the main northeast entrance and a smaller access entrance in the south. The Avery holes are believed to have held Welsh bluestones, and there are currently 45 surviving bluestones at Stonehenge. One of the uh, one of the fun things to jump in here uh, is just the visual of this is they basically d dug a circle ditch and then they made a high wall on the inside and a low wall on the outside. So at this point in time, um, the Stonehenge looks almost like a Civil War fort <laughs> uh, from the you know, it's like it's like a basic entrenchment. I mean, if you think about it. Um... There, there's this idea that, you know, you would pack dirt underneath the stone. Yeah. To help raise it, so you get up just a little bit enough to put dirt under it, and then you can slowly kind of just repeat that process. And if there's a little smaller wall on the outside or on the inside, it keeps it from going. Yeah, they basically dug dug the ditch and it just 
it's just funny to me how it just looks like you know like a like a civil war for it. I'm just like yeah oh look at that yep <laughs> i think you might want to clarify american civil war yeah because we are talking yeah. about something that's in england we are and... talking about something that's in... yeah but england doesn't have one civil war <laughs> they have 12 or 15 <laughs> something like that i don't know there's more there, there's more than we care to count <laughs> but what you're telling me and correct me if i'm wrong here but you're saying that these Mesolithic people had the knowledge and capacity to erect these stones themselves. Yes, yes Justin. Yes, Justin. I'm just, I want to point that yes. out for the people at home. Yes. We, this, by the you, time you Stonehenge all, you is all were the ones given, given the pseudo hot takeover there, and I was telling people <laughs> it's not druidic, it's humans, it's all this stuff. You were the one who was all like, no, no, no. Yes, of course. Yeah. I, we like to poke fun. We like yeah, to we'll poke the bear. Stuff. But we also it's like to don't... point out that this is actual humans of yeah. antiquity. Yeah. yeah. Is, Do not is... devil's advocate pseudoscience, please. <laughs> like I said before, by the time Stonehenge yeah. is being built, there's already a like a very strong mes mes um or no not mes yeah. mes megalithic god i can't talk a megalithic structure building society yes. if not one big you know probably not one big society but the traditions there yeah the the uh what is known uh as the british isles have been working with megalithic art for uh for centuries at least by the time uh stonehenge goes up um so also there are in fact cremation burials mm -hmm. here um so far um it's yep there's uh it's estimated to a there's uh estimated to be about 150 to 240 cremation cremation burials that have been excavated already no um, no, which, no no it says 64 of an estimated 150 oh, sorry, sorry. have been excavated so we've gotten about We've gotten about one in every three or four, according to the according to the charts. And a majority of them were male, essentially adult males. Um, mm -hmm. Most from what we've gathered, um, it's also the largest burial site in Britain for the third millennium BCE. You know, because all, all the burials at the Aubrey Hole took place from about 3000 to 2300. So. Basically, I believe the first uh, two or so stages of Stonehenge construction. <laughs> yes. um, there's also an altar stone. Um, it's a fallen upright stone. Um, it's believed to have been part of the first stage. Uh, it's named the altar stone because architect Inigo Jones bum, 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 bum. preferred the idea bum, bum. of a sacrificial altar at the center. It's so he thought, ah, yeah. That's probably where. That's probably yeah. what they were doing here. Yeah, people it's, were it's, killing each other right here. This is right where it happened. Li listen, listen. I know you've been using this space for something else, but this room would be perfect if we redesigned it as a sacrificial altar. <laughs> that's basically what he did. He's that. Uh, he's that garbage designer that's going to tear down walls in your home to make some sort of French thing. It's uh, an open good. design, but we're going to do some feng shui, and you know. The color yellow is really in right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, God. It's architects. What are they good for? Mm -hmm. We like engineers here. Yeah, yes. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, I, that was purely a joke. Yeah. Uh, so there's also a heel stone. The heel stone, it's an unworked Saracen stone outside the northeastern entrance. Uh, it's believed to have been part, also part of the first stage or even an earlier like pre-stage to this um yeah. there's also a row of timber post holes located around that same entrance um the posts all may have also been used to track the moon on its northern major limit uh limit so mm -hmm. uh like when you're facing the moon in like this part of the world it's kind of like the upper limit yeah and then there's, there's also two how far north in the night sky the moon can go <laughs> yeah pretty much um so there's also two sandstone monoliths yeah that are also present at this time um but there doesn't appear to be a lot of activity between the first and second stages except for human burials yeah. and I, um, I will say like those last two monoliths right there are why uh this gets classified as the first stage of construction for stonehenge 
because it is the first time someone erects a stone at Stonehenge. Everything else to this point has been earthworks and wood. Yeah. And that's why it's classed separate from, like, the last uh, four to 5,000 years of activity. <laughs> is because of those two stones. <laughs> but in the second stage, which is the about 2640 to 2480 BCE, that's where we get the stones! We get yeah, that's stones, where the stones start coming. finally! <laughs> yeah. So, um, the Saracen Stones are brought from Avery, uh, the Avery area of Mar Marlborough Downs, yep. about 20 miles north of Stonehenge. They're smoothed with Saracen Hammers just outside the entrance. Uh, the stones arrange inside the circle in a horseshoe shape. Yep. Uh, the stones form five tall trilithons, yep. um, which is like the two uprights with a lintel. Um, central and largest of these is the giant trilithon. Yeah, so yeah, and so the trilithons here, what we were talking about is we were talking about these five big ones right here in the middle of the henge. Mm -hmm. This is the supposed altar stone, or this is, I think, the heel stone. And these are the five trilithons, these nice big little uh, half H's. And if you're not watching on YouTube, you have no clue what that is. Yeah, it's a, Just I do have close visual your eyes and for, imagine for YouTube, really, really but hard. But it's the it's it's you know it's this night it's a U shape in uh in the center of the monument. So uh, that this is not the perimeter that is being built here. This is the yeah. center. Let's see. So the stones are laid out in units and subunits of the long foot. Yeah. Long oh, long foot was an ancient unit of measurement. Yeah, it's slightly longer than the modern foot. I believe it's like one point one two five feet yeah. per long foot. So it's some it's it's some just it's just slightly off from what from what we use today uh, yeah. in America. Um, um, thanks so for to, we used to that be a England. real nation. <laughs> um, and uh, it's uh, just important note because we did jump over it. Uh, the trilithons are surrounded by thirty uprights linked with curved lintels, and that is the main perimeter around Stonehenge. That is that lovely circle, is uh, thirty of these lovely. And that lintels. one's no longer there, right? Uh, yeah, no. This is a reconstruction of Stonehenge once it is finished. Uh, that I am using. This is Stonehenge as of like fifteen twenty, as we understand it, circa I believe twenty eighteen. <laughs> All right, yeah. So this model is that I'm using. Um, so cool about the lentils is each one weighs about seven tons. Um, the lentils are are held onto upright posts by mortise and tendon joints. Um, also some dovetail joints as well. Uh, uh, dovetail mortise and tendon are dovetail joints. Dovetail is just the descriptive word for it. It's the the dovetail oh, is yeah. the W shape. Uh, and it just goes down onto a little arrow and it just locks on like that. And the lintels fit together with tongue and groove joints. Yeah, which um, is if you stick out your tongue, you get that nice U shape. And it's sort of a U shape going into a U shaped hole. <laughs> it's kind of thought that that's like based off like how woodworking joints work, where you kind of like carve like a little bit and then you stick them in. Which, you know, they were putting wooden uh, monuments up in this area, you know, for several thousand years prior to attempting to build this uh, Stonehenge, so... Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. it. So what well, you're we saying well is build different... it the same way we were building the other shit. <laughs> so what you're saying is people were able to innovate and use skills from other other skills yep. to... It's, it's almost as if it's almost as if the stick stands upright when X, therefore the stone will stand upright when X. <laughs> Laws of physics transferred, and people just went with it. Wow. They're just like, huh, this tall log rock is basically just a really hard and stick. heavy stick. Yeah. I also would just tell you the lengths that humans will go through just to build shit. I mean... Okay. Yeah, he yeah. Humans go through extreme lengths to do anything. All right, in Japan they eat fubu. All right, puffer fish is deadly, deadly, deadly poisonous, almost no matter what. <laughs> but it is now a delicacy because we figured I, out how to eat it. <laughs> I mean, just imagine. I mean, how many Olympic stadiums are like around the globe that have just been abandoned just for one Olympics? Almost every single one. Yeah, that's, all that's that awesome. effort and preparation just for that. And then the event's over, and then they kind of just get abandoned. 
Or if you're in Rio, no effort in preparation and you're still abandoned. <laughs> Ooh. I'm hey, sorry, anyways. but they had sewage in the Olympic swimming pools. <laughs> oh, God, I forgot about that. Let's go back so to Stonehenge point, and okay, out of the favela and, of yeah. Brazil. And uh, now back to Stonehenge, something that is not Brazil. <laughs> uh, let's see. All, let's see. All the joints. Salt side. All the joints were created with Saracen. Yeah, imitation of the woodwork. Um, Saracen upright stones are about 25 tons and are about 18 feet high. Uh, the great trilithon upright weighs over 45 tons. So these, these, these are pretty big. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, the great trial thought stands about are about 29 and 32 feet high yeah um, they've uh one has sunken a little bit over time yeah so <laughs> it can, it's just kind of like sliding so not the best yeah. foundation work mm -hmm. gotta admit yeah. only okay. stood up for what it, like eight thousand uh, years five thousand five thousand okay you know yeah, so, and but let's be honest one. they didn't have basements or you know any knowledge of how earthquakes happen <laughs> Yes, and there's only one that's still standing up. Yeah. So, um, could have done, yeah. done better. Yeah. yeah. There's, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. See, and then only six of the original 230 lintels are still standing upright as well in the Saracen Circle. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then, like, two more kind of are, like, on the ground nearby. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, fun fact uh, three of the five Saracen Trilithon lintels in the middle are still up so the big ones in the middle are doing a lot better than the perimeter yeah and then four of the uh, from the saracen four uprights of the saracen circle are also kind of just gone yeah yeah one is uh one is in fact appears to have been uh um split in half and taken yeah so there's some really? indication that some of the stones uh were re were reused during the roman and medieval periods yep so i mean that's not unusual. That's, That's not unusual. pretty I mean, common. Like, like we yeah. need big rocks. Oh, hey, there's a bunch of big rocks. We're going to take big rocks. Yeah. And uh, outside of uh, Stonehenge proper, there was also the uh, the station stones, which are uh, four stones that were built near the uh, original Aubrey Hole ring. They made a little rectangle, followed the same uh, northeast solar axis as the entrance to Stonehenge. And there's only one of them left. There's now just one standing there. Just they've all been taken. Jeez. All right. Uh, uh, Dustin, do you want to take the other half? The other two? Which are uh, the third stage or the third uh, stage? Yeah. Take the third stage because in the last couple stages, there's it's really just modifications. Yeah. All righty. So the third, third stage, which lasted from 2470 to 2280 BCE had the side ditches and banks of Ceremonial Avenue from Stonehenge to the River Avon, which was about two miles long, or about three kilometers, and it was radiocarbon dated. The mm, width... Yeah, this... What's up? No, just like, yeah, this is this is where we finally get, like, empirical uh, facts in this chronology, is, like, radiocarbon dating finally gets involved. <laughs> which radiocarbon dating is testing any organic compound for how much of the carbon-14 is decayed. So, you can't use it on rocks, folks. Yeah, no, it's only uh, yeah. on organic material, so it's very hard to do on old sites because organic stuff decays. Yep. But they built an avenue by digging through the dirt, and the stuff they used for that definitely can. <laughs> Hello, antler shovel. <laughs> so yes, we're able to actually put a definitive date on the site and see what people were doing. And in this case, they built a giant route from Stonehenge to the river, and it varied anywhere from 60 to 115 feet wide, and it ends in a small henge at the riverside, and the henge is about 100 feet or so in diameter. Yep. Well, that end, the pathway, is what, 1,500 feet from Stonehenge is aligned with the summer solstice sunrise and the winter solstice sunset so it still fits in that um solstice Eight. alignment that the site takes yep it's the first 1600 feet and five or 500 meters which is whichever comes first they're the same <laughs> <laughs> look yep, it's uh 
And so like right here, we get our radiocarbon dating, which lets us get much more exact dates. And then from there, we're able to look at the stratigraphy and figure out just how long it's been before and after the, this avenue, all the rest of the things start happening. And if uh, that's, you, you could do oh, the yeah. next stages too. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, that's going to bring us to stages 4, 5, and 6, which collectively take from 2280 to 1520 BCE when uh, construction stops and stays stopped. Uh, for the fourth stage, which is 2280 to 2030, uh, the blue stones that are within the inner circle, they're not easy to see on our visual aid uh, here, but they are these little dots between the trilithons and the uh, outer ring. Uh, the blue stones are rearranged from a perfect circle into an oval, sort of refining the uh, alignment of the shape within Stonehenge to fit the, uh, seeming to fit the lunar cycle uh, solstice a little bit better. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's om it's almost like they are refining their uh, uh, whatever pseudo calendric system they are using here. We really don't know. They did not write anything down, so we really don't have the exact purpose of everything that's happening. Which I think it's an that's a good point to uh, point out here real quick is when P when academics use the term prehistoric versus historic, it's almost entirely based on written record. So yeah. that's why we call this a prehistoric site versus a historic site. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, prehistoric and archaeology is different than prehistoric and paleontology, guys. <laughs> Technically, everything in paleontology is prehistoric. <laughs> all right, all right. Demonetization <laughs> from ingenocide. Uh, fifth stage, uh, we start seeing them begin to expand outside of the Stonehenge ring proper once again. Ooh, uh, from from 2030 to 1750 there's a ring of pits called z holes that are dug outside the sarsen her uh, circle and um i really don't have any reason why they did this <laughs> uh the same goes for what they do next which is from 1750 to 1520 they build a ring of pits called the y holes that are dug alongside the z holes as sort of a second ring of circles now I believe maybe something was supposed to have been erected in here, but none of that has survived. Uh, they are called the Z and Y holes simply because when we charted them out as archaeologists, uh, speaking collectively for all archaeologists ever, that was the tag we put on them in the sense of place name here when we figure out what the hell is going on. <laughs> but yeah. And, uh, yeah, with 1520 construction stops... About a thousand years later, the Celts and the Druids move in, and then about 500 years after that, the Romans arrive, and that's when this uh, monument goes from a state of neglect to a state of uh, destruction. <laughs> Those pesky Romans, they come into Britannia, and look at what they do. Yep, they found London. <sighs> <laughs> you know, what did the Romans ever do for them? Besides, oh. you know, do not launch a Monty. Do not launch a Monty Python speech. Ah. <laughs> the life of Brian. Uh, but do not stop then, it. no. But circling back, the ground in and around Stonehenge. After that, after the looting of the Romans, was uh, and disturbed. The people. Yeah, was disturbed by uh, excavations around the 16th century, or since the 16th yeah. century. Yeah, the 16th century is when uh, it finally comes to the attention of uh, human beings again after so being forgotten and neglected over extended periods of time. And uh, want to point out again, it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and there's a certain scholastic interest in it, which is simultaneously horrifying and endearing, uh, because we kick it off with... Uh, William Camden, he's a historian and antiquarian, so basically he reads a lot of history books and likes to collect things that don't belong to him. A proto-archaeologist. Yeah. We love him. He finds... Uh, uh, yep. He comes... He he no, he makes notes uh, in, in his records that, hey, in this area, around these stone things, there's burnt bone and ashes uh, in the ground. He doesn't really disturb Stonehenge proper and moves on. Then yes, in good one. Yep. Then in 1620, we get George Villers, uh, our first villain of the story. Uh, 
he goes right into the circle of Stonehenge and just starts chucking dirt out in an effort to find treasure because they put these rocks here, therefore there must be gold. Oh, you know, the 16th century, full of privateers, musketeers. 17th century. Villers is from 1620. 17th century, so... This is why yeah. you never trust a guy named George. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. As an American. Yeah, especially, we... if he's, especially if he calls himself George the Three. Yeah. Oh. You'll so much history back. slander. We are see. so much, so much slander on England. We do not apologize. Uh, then in the 18th century, so a hundred years after Villers, a man named William Stuckley he surveys the monuments. Uh, doesn't really do too much with it, but he does give a survey. So interest is starting to happen. People have noticed this is here again. Which then, he, oh, I like these. Hundred years after that things get interesting yes from 1874 to 1877 good old flanders petrie makes the first accurate map of stonehenge yep cool and, finally they and just finally the end, looked at the stones yeah. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, i know finally someone decided to draw the dang thing and then after that good old charles darwin yep, in 1877 18... when he was done drawing it charles darwin went and dug it up <laughs> well, he was looking Why? for earthworms he wanted yeah he dug two pits inside stonehenge to study how earthworms move in rocky dirt two of the most famous 19th century scientists <laughs> drawing the attention of this site it's yeah well if you're really interested about uh famous uh, people from like the 18th and 19th centuries or even 20th centuries being drawn to megaliths uh arthur stone is the location where uh c.s lewis had the inspiration for aslan yep Ooh. which that was where i was digging at i was digging around that area yes you're so proud we hate you yes i got to dig oh i didn't get to dig I... at the dolmen unfortunately that was you like filthy year, I didn't get to do it. cahokia I versus stonehenge everybody that's the war in this in this chat cahokia. i like both damn you cahokia. i like i both. dug at cahokia <laughs> and uh 1901 so turn of the 20th century we have william goland performing the first archaeological excavation of stonehenge so it's actually recorded actual methodology actual archaeology occurs not just uh various people coming onto the land with shovels picks axes and thankfully not dynamite i was gonna say please tell me no dynamite no dynamite. <laughs> no, no dynamite and uh throughout the throughout the 20th century the eastern half of stonehenge is excavated by two men from 1919 to 1926 by william holly and from 1950 to 1978 by Richard Atkinson. Not Hold on, this guy's been 28 years? Yep. And, but the results were only published in 1995 after they could incorporate revisions from carbon dating. Ooh, okay. Good idea. So that's one thing that does happen a lot. And it's yep. what's called the publishing lag in the field yep. of like, from the time you actually do the excavations... You, th you synthesize your data, you get the correct dates, you correct everything, you calibrate it. It could be years after when you actually have done the first excavations. In this case, it was almost a century because even with the first excavations and the later ones, they had all this relative chronology, but no way to space it in time. Both, you know, they couldn't plant any physical dates really on it beyond several thousand years ago and then at some point during the thousand years before that x happened and uh it took carbon dating with that uh with that trench in stage uh three to finally get things mapped wow and then in uh 1986 stonehenge becomes a unesco world heritage site yay so, historical heritage yep and uh now in the 21st century the stonehenge riverside project uh runs excavations to continue to refine our understanding of the henge and uh to yell at people who keep trying to build motorways next to the monument. i was gonna say like you gotta mention the motorway <laughs> well we're there we've, we've made it to the end of the timeline the motorway is like the last five years yeah no i, I like it was it was there was quite a bit of discussion about that wall when i was there last year and i just want to say what person what person really thinks 
it is a good idea to put a major highway that runs underneath it <laughs> with 45 <laughs> ton stones. The same person who designs a subway, uh, I'm guessing. <laughs> like, the, like once again, this is why this is why you listen to archaeologists when they say the site would be endangered if you tried to build something stupid like a highway underneath. Mm -hmm. You fucking hey. listen. <laughs> hey, hey, speak, speaking of bad ideas around Stonehenge, oh, you no. like hear some of the things people thought Stonehenge did. Yes, I, let's get I into it. Uh, rage rage like, mode. Uh, all right. So I'm going to go through the timeline here, starting all the way back in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, we have English antiquarian, guy who takes things that aren't his, John Aubrey, and archaeologist William Stuckley um, both come up with a theory that maybe this is Stonehenge is a Druid temple. Um, there were no dates for Stonehenge other than it's pre-Roman. And the most that was really known about pre-Roman Britain at the time was that Celtic Druids were pre-Roman because they are conquered by the Romans. Therefore, they're pre-Roman. And that was about all history had to say on the subject. So that's where they were. This has been disproven. Stonehenge stopped being built a thousand years before the Druids ever set foot on the British Isles. And just like so that, religious thousands, yeah. thousands yeah. of there, people are heartbroken. I mean, yeah. there there is a talk about there, whether or not Stonehenge has, still st was in use in some capacity for other, other reasons. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. even in the it Saxon is, period, we have um, them used as like an ex ex uh, yeah, execution maybe. spot. Yeah, well, the well the Stonehenge gets its name from uh, from the Saxons, actually. Uh, it is from the Saxon term Stanhegen, which means stone hanging or gallows. Oh. So it, is, it is possible that uh, it could Celts could have used it for a religious purpose at, during their time, but that's not the original purpose. Yeah. What, what is known is that the neo pagan organizations and the modern druids have claimed it as their own even though um, the uh, pagan and druidic uh, cultures from which they are claiming uh, descendancy were not the original constructors. So once again, the British taking things for their own. Yeah, here we go. Uh, in 1963, we have an American getting into the fray with all the Englishmen. So we have Gerald Hawkins. Astronomer. Uh, yep. He is Gerald, he's an but he's an American. So we have Gerald Hawkins propose that Stonehenge tracks eclipses. And uh, there's a number of other astronomical capabilities attributed to Stonehenge. Um, some of them are quite mystical. All of them have either been disproven or rejected, including Hawkins. Uh, regarding Stonehenge, it does not track eclipses. It does not predict the end of the world. It is not an apocalypse calendar. Yeah, that's well, the Mayans, guys. Get it right. There goes my weekend plans. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, it is it. It does align with the solstice. That is what it does. <laughs> that is its purpose. As still far a as we calendar, can... just not yeah, apocalypse. Still... Yeah, it is. It is not. It is not predicting every bad event that will ever happen in England or things like. It cannot see the future, guys. <laughs> Unless the world ends on twelve twenty one, twelve, three thousand and twelve. <laughs> Please stop. Please stop yourself. <laughs> in uh, 1973, English archaeologist Colin Renfrew had the hypothesis Ooh. that Stonehenge was the capital of this great confederation of chiefs. A uh, small problem with that. There are no buildings for living people at Stonehenge. <laughs> and uh, I don't think he the... quite meant it as like a center of like a, like a city that they all... I think he meant it more of like this is a meeting place, a gathering ground, especially because they were very mobile was, people that came back. Well, 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 no, no, no. See, the later theories that disprove him claim that. Yeah. Mm. The later theories that uh, are the ones currently in use today is that this was a seasonal gathering place at the border of many territories that people gathered to make exchanges and do other things at. His version is sort of like... Um, uh, the Iroquois Confederation having a capital that was Stonehenge. Oh, okay. Where it's That's like right. where it's a single political entity that is sort of like we are the ten tribes of the Confederation. We meet here to uh, 
to discuss our politics and uh, make our political agendas, which is not the case. It is not the capital of some uh, of some alliance or empire. Um, in ninety eight, the Malagasy archaeologist Ramel Sanina, uh, and uh, Malagasy, uh, for those who may not know, is a uh, is an ethnic group from Madagascar. So uh, it's an outside outside perspective. We don't really get to see the Malagasy come up too often, and uh, it was very fun to find that. Oh, yeah, um, yeah that's 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 a cool tidbit. I like yeah. that. Yeah, he proposed that Stonehenge was a monument to the afterlife and that the stones themselves were a representation of the eternal afterlife with, you know, the fact that, you know, they're here after so long. Um, this has not okay. been accepted as a uh, as uh, accurate. That's an interesting take. Yep. Uh, On to the next finally, Absurd Legends. Yep. Finally, and this is the last of the sane ones because it's going to go completely crazy after this point. In 2008, uh, British archaeologists Tim Darville and Geoffrey Rain Wainwright, uh, first of his name, Lord of the Andals, and uh, oh my God, man, uh, suggested that Stonehenge was a place of healing, uh, sort of a uh, um, you know, sort of a healing shrine for people to go to to uh, you know have their ailments removed. However, the uh, previously mentioned excavations of all the uh, deceased in the area. They do not show indication of ailment or injury any more or less than anywhere else in all of Great Britain. Oh, well, fair. And if this was a place of healing, then in theory, people would have signs of severe disease, old age, or uh, severe injury coming here and then not making it. Uh, but that is not the case. Finally, for the fun ones. According to the Arthurian tradition... Stonehenge was summoned from Ireland and assembled by giants at the behest of the wizard Merlin. Checks out. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that's probably oh, the most likely one yeah. so far. Like the stones were brought over with the giants or like the stones... Like Merlin, con Merlin conjured Stonehenge and the giants from Ireland. Brought like He teleported the rocks and the giants from Ireland to Stonehenge, ordered them to build it, and then blip the giants out of existence. Yes. I'm just imagining these giants were just having their fun, like just eating their dinner, and suddenly they just appear in like a new land, and there's a tiny man with a funny hat saying, Hey, yeah, look. build this. Build these according, to our, according to Arthurian legend, uh, uh, most Irishmen uh, use trees as either toothpicks or javelins and don't know what a boat is. <laughs> but they know That's Mesolithic a... structure building. Apparently. Oh, so it's not Checks so the They're English also master words. sailors despite never knowing what a boat is. It's hilarious. <laughs> the no, contradictions what you're in Arthurian is, legends. This is the first time the English uh took Irish captives from Oh the no! no! Oh god. Anyway, uh moving on from the medieval myth. The wrath of the Irish the, the next theory is that it's somehow Danish. Um, apparently the Danes, uh, came through just before William the Conqueror and built it during their, like, five weeks of invading England. Wait a minute, wait a minute, this is Wiltshire. This was still very much under Wessex control. Yep. Like I said, somehow Danes. <laughs> the Danes are never in, are never in this territory, not, not to the extent of ever actually ruining it. Second, uh, despite there being no arch architectural parallels, it's Roman because it has to be because no one else here can build anything, apparently. Well, yeah, the Romans are master master constructionists, and uh, yeah. yeah. They would have used concrete. They, the Romans yeah, Roman, concrete. Yeah, there, there, there are so many things not Roman about this structure that it's just hilarious. That's the only train of thought I could think of, but uh, I also do want to... Which is that it's round. <laughs> I, I do also want to step on a little bit of a pedestal here because one of the reasons why theories like that persist in the field is honestly very racist and very race-based in that, oh, prehistoric people could not have had the capability to do so. It must have been the Romans. They basically go to, like, the oldest version of a competent 
society in that regard. Well, they, they go to the oldest version of a militant society is what they do. Yeah. So. Another example of this is when um, <laughs> Spanish and Portuguese uh, explorers were going around Southeast Asia and they ran into, you know, like structures built by the Khmer and um, yeah. in that in Southeast Asia, that those kinds of structures like Angkor Wat. They their idea for why this these were here was not because the locals did it was because Alexander actually did go all the way through India, yep. and that <laughs> that that was actually where like the the whole um, mutiny happened and then he left because there was no more worlds to conquer because yeah. he just reached the Pacific Ocean and turned around. Yeah, yeah. There's also Great Zimbabwe in Africa, which is a which was theorized to be King Solomon's dominion because, let's be honest, uh, apparently people can't make houses. <laughs> despite being, you know, people. Well, and... but there's been examples of this in history, and we've got a few more fun examples of things going wrong for uh, Stonehenge. Like a... that also, uh, this leads into the point where people can no longer justify using the example of the Romans did it, Europeans had to have been here at some point. They switch to aliens. Yep, because the next one is that this is somehow a landing pad for UFOs. The aliens, they land here. This is, this is where it, they land. Not built by aliens. It's a landing pad that humans made for aliens, which I think is somehow doubly stupid. Like, come on, you're invading this planet and you don't bring your own damn infrastructure? No, I 100% believe some humans would build a landing pad for aliens. Now, I say that in a modern tense. I could think I could see some random wacko doing it, but I don't think prehistoric folks were building alien no. landing pads. I mean, some random wackos decided to build what they consider a life-size reconstruction it, of the ark. It, listen, listen. There yeah, is. We don't talk this about is not an alien. This is not an alien saying. landing pad. This is not an alien landing pad. Uh, I can guarantee that. What it is is a fertility uh, symbol fingers. of the female yeah, genitalia. My, yeah, my, that's my per, that's my personal favorite. It's a sex club. Yeah, you, swingers you club for fertility, and you're supposed to go in there and uh, um, make babies uh, in like total like stereotypical Woodstock, uh, according to your hyper conservative grandfather. Neolithic sex cult. Neolithic <laughs> sex cult. Neolithic sex cult. Stop saying that. Actually, We're that would be an, an incredible, incredible metal band name. <laughs> oh, we are the Neolithic sex cult. <laughs> Guys, this is going to be. This is a reformative band. We're going to make an offshoot band. <laughs> All right. Mm. Justin, you know, you know, you know what page this is going on, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, please. Oh. <laughs> oh, going from Neolithic sex cult, we're going to actually jump over to the motherland and talk about Ireland, which has another, uh, what is it, Mesolithic structure? Um, yes, I do believe it is uh, also Mesolithic. Uh, it is 5,200 year old. Uh, it is called Newgrange. Yes. Classic. We and it is a... It is a passage tomb in the Boyne Valley of County Meath, Ireland, uh, which uh, makes me very sad because it is a uh, it is a Leinster uh, um, construction and not a Connacht construction. As a Connacht man himself, I uh, uh, I am deeply saddened by finding out that there are cool things in other parts of Ireland. Yeah, bought it all for ourselves. <laughs> hey, my 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 family lived in this region. You pay homage to that name. According to 23 and me, so did mine. And also Kenny Cork. Yeah, Listen, well, I'm, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna go stay back Aaron, in Roth. <laughs> according to those websites, I'm related to like 70% of European royalty. I mean, yeah. everybody's practically descended from uh, Charlemagne at this point. Yeah, but anyway, um, New Grange is it, it was completed, its construction was built 200 years before Stonehenge as Stonehenge was even started yeah uh, that's how old this is uh it was built with two hundred thousand tons of material wow. and it was abandoned in the uh iron age around the third century bce following the arrival of the celts which means that uh fun very fun things one of the legends about this uh 
uh, monument is that it is a Tuatha de Donan monument belonging to uh, a Tuatha king. And the Tuatha de Donan are the people on Ireland before the Celts. Uh, they are simultaneously gods, giants, fairies, and humans. And so technically, <laughs> technically it's Tuatha because it's pre-Celt. <laughs> To be fair, there was a fairy tree right next to the grounds of Newgrange. Yeah. So, uh, funny, so funny thing that's always that's been discussed um, about like pre-Celtic Ireland is um, the people who did inhabit it. There's um, the only evidence we really have is usually essentially pottery, um, but we don't really see like the migrations into ireland itself is pretty difficult other than they had to have had like some boats because there was no land bridge when humans were going through um like with the with britain prop with britain itself um there was doggerland which people migrate over but ireland didn't have that same uh luxury so that literally meant people had to have built boats at some point to like actually go over there like this can't this isn't like someone like being shipped a bunch of people being shipped right it's not enough to form a stable population Oh, but yeah. Yeah, it's it really good. interesting it's a really interesting part of um ireland's history that's not really well documented or covered yeah, yeah. and uh so fun fact with uh, newgrange uh guess how new guess how newgrange was discovered oh oh i know this one i know this one dynamite yeah. they were no. taking the stone to build yep. elsewhere yep charles uh charles campbell in 1699 uh had decided that he wanted some rocks for a project of his. And so he ordered his servants to grab some from the nearby hill thing. And when they did, uh, some of the rocks fell and revealed the opening to the uh, uh, to the Newgrange uh, monument. That's a pretty valid way of discovering ancient monument because it's it was prior to he, its reconstruction just a yeah, slump he, hill. Yeah, and uh, he was... And, fun, and the fun thing is, what... Campbell was doing to Newgrange is what the Romans and medieval Britons were doing to Stonehenge, which is just <laughs> grabbing the big rock and hauling it over to do something else with. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a normal yeah. process of re of reuse. Yeah, but it's just, it just it just sort of you know lends a little uh, you know more insight to that period of time on Stonehenge because, well, you know, there's much better records from you know the end of the 17th century than there are from you know the first <laughs> well and new grange is incredible because it's it's massive it's 270 yeah. feet in diameter and 43 feet high and it's yeah. a circular monument and it includes earthworks around it so they shape the hill to the side of this monument and yeah. the whole thing is about an acre of land so it's it's a pretty big yeah you see the hand gestures <laughs> it's uh it's big big acre it's a, but it's a nice nice odd thing yeah but what's really really cool about it and i actually got the chance to go inside of it is there's this passageway that you walk through and it's not very big but it's like 60 or 63, it's 63 or, feet long 63 oh exactly 63 long. feet long and like yeah. you go inside and you enter in this tiny chamber and it's got three little alcoves on uh each side which they um were saying it, that um that there were potentially remains found in the alcoves but when you turn around you see perfectly out this like little box that they had above you as you walked into the passage but that perfectly aligned during the solstice and would show right at the back of the passage yeah yeah like, so it it's is the a, coolest uh... thing and they had a a light that mimicked it sorry yeah yeah no it is a very cool thing and uh little bit of like architecture stuff coming through here so the 63 foot passageway which is 19 meters for those of you not in america ends in what is a cruciform chamber which is a cross shape with a corbelled roof which is uh what one of the things that makes this monument pretty interesting for its construction was the use of corbelled roof because what corbelled means is you take stone inset it into a wall and have it jut out just a little bit then you take the next stone inset it into the wall and have it jet out just a little bit more than the next stone and so on and so on until you reach connection so the cool so thing is when you're inside of there and you yeah. look up at it you can see the stacked rocks in the circular pattern 
and it, if you've ever like stacked rocks on a beach or something it looks exactly like that except they had enough space that it basically created an arched roof and in order to do that without causing a collapse you have to have planned the whole thing ahead of time or else you will be putting rocks up there and they'll be falling and potentially taking the rock below them with it because you have to inset something heavy into a wall that is already jutting out over a cliff <laughs> you can very it's very easy to cause a collapse but you could uh, see the intentionality and i think that's one of the most impressive things being there yeah. is you could see just how intentional the rock placement was because every layer you could see just how perfect the measurements were it was it, it, it was so impressive it, it indicates that at this time in ireland there is some um, specialized labor um at this point which is why uh, a lot of the things i saw said that it was made by farmers because the only way to get uh, enough people together consistently and specialized to do this was to have a population that had agricultural roots. Uh, it was something like uh, it would take 300 years with, it would take 30 years with a population of 300 specialists uh, in order to make the monuments. Uh, so 300 specialists support them for 30 years. You're gonna need agriculture to do that and that circles surplus. back to that food surplus like when you have enough yeah. soup for food surplus for people to specialize you're showing advanced levels of civilization yeah it's almost yeah. as if there is a food surplus people yeah. will just be creative <laughs> yeah yeah it's you know it's this is this is you know 300 specialists so you're looking at a population of a few thousand uh in order to a, to make this it was an early welfare state you had a bunch yeah. of artists living off of the farmers okay. backs and look at what they made yeah i mean so, half uh, the time but they probably doubled honestly yep yeah, so uh, the uh yeah the uh, monument predates both stonehenge and the great pyramids uh there has been no evidence of any sort of iron or metal tools in its construction so it's pure uh stone uh stone tool construction yeah and it is surrounded by 97 curb stones which are these towering stones that are decorated with uh mesolithic art or megalithic art oh so that leads to a uh, bunch of conspiracies because we don't yep. know the meaning and we don't know what they represent but there's a lot of swirls a lot of different patterns yeah a lot of a lot of the celtic styles you know swirls and things and so, uh yeah, the I'm entrance sure stone that. yep the entrance stone uh is uh named so because at the entrance it's the most striking of them all and uh the 97 curb stones makes New Drain Newgrange the largest number of uh, of curb stones anywhere in Ireland. Um, although it has been argued that one of uh, Newgrange's sister sites, I believe uh, Noth, uh, has better uh, has a better design, has better designed ones. <laughs> well, and part of the curb stones also go back to the history of it being reconstructed, as they were used as like a foundation for the structure and arranged in a circular pattern yeah yeah so and, new grange has was re fully reconstructed uh some people took some creative liberties when reconstructing it a few artistic but, liberties but yeah, that Thunder. happens every time <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah uh, my favorite is um like how uh, stonehenge was translated from the saxon for gallows um uh the irish for uh for Newgrange is Bruna Boyne, which means womb of the moon. Uh, or womb of the bright cow, which I just find that much more uh, entertaining. I like the idea that people thought that the moon was just a very bright cow. I mean, in a sense, it kind of does because it has like the little spot, like it looks like the little like darker textures, yeah. you know, around it. It well, looks like it, it looks like a, it looks like a giant circular cow. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's like why not? Uh yeah, and there's a uh, big roly poly and, cow in the sky. It's very bright. Yeah. And uh Newgrange did join uh UNESCO's World Heritage in nineteen ninety three alongside uh the rest of Bruna Bruin, which is Newgrange, Noth, Douth, and thirty five small mounds. Uh so it is a collective landscape that is protected. Really cool. Highly recommend visiting if you ever get the chance. Home to about yeah. 200,000 visitors a year. 
Yep, uh, which is about one fifth of the traffic at Stonehenge. Stonehenge hosts about a million. Boo! So which, it's uh, it's off the which, beaten path, which, mean, <laughs> which means that it is uh it is far less uh likely to have to deal with a lot of um wear and tear from uh, tourism. Uh, yeah, believe still it or has not, still a significant amount, but not nearly as much as Stonehenge. Believe it or not, even, that's one of the based on to why certain archaeological sites aren't made into like really big tourist spots is because just you being there like people just even slightly touching anything causes wear and tear like you think like oh if not, not even that once. aaron um the cave paintings in france the levro cave paintings yeah. their breaths the moisture from exhaling was starting yeah. to deteriorate the paint so they had to fully yeah. close it off but yeah. that led to a really cool mitigation measure <laughs> They completely recreated the cave and recreated the paintings and the lighting and everything so you could get the same experience while still preserving in place the originals. Yeah. And, also, and, uh, they, um, but yeah, like you think like it's just you? No. This is like a bunch of other people doing the exact same thing and where and that kind of wear just accumulates slowly that you if you were to go back five years later, you might not see it unless you knew what to look for. We didn't even yeah. mention the fact that Stonehenge, you can no longer get near the stones because people were going there and chipping the rocks so they could take souvenirs home with them. And yeah. every person thinks, it's not a lot, it's just a little for me. And then three million people do it, and we have half of the Plymouth Rock left. Yeah, that's a uh, call <laughs> back <Astrid>. there. Uh -oh. <laughs> Met, uh, and uh, speaking of people going places, so you can only allow it in on, into New into Newgrange on set guided tours, and uh, you're only allowed in on the uh, on the uh, dawn of the winter solstice. If I can speak, you're only allowed in if you win a lottery. So when you take the tour, at the end of the tour, you put your name in, and they do a raffle, and they like, yeah. So you can win a lottery to be in new inside Newgrange when when it lights up uh, oh. with the coming of the dawn. But like That'd I said, they got a little site. light bulb in there that mimics it, so it's like the real thing. Yeah, but it's not the same yeah, experience. But, but you know, experiencing in the dawn, and even when it's overcast, it's you know, it's very fun to be there in the darkness with the little bit of light that does get through. Also, people do in fact still leave offerings there. I that's a that's a little tidbit I I saw. Um, I think it's really kind of sweet. Yeah, and uh, there are uh, there are a couple legends around Newgrange, just as there are legends around Stonehenge. Although uh, the legends from Newgrange have gotten, are shall we say, they're less harmful than some of the ones around Stonehenge. A lot of the ones around Stonehenge seem to revolve around taking credence away from the people who built it, uh, whereas the legends around Newgrange seem to focus more on other aspects, like mythology. Yeah, like mythology. Yeah. So the first one is that Newgrange is the burial place of ancient kings, specifically Dagda Mor and his sons. Uh, Dagda Mor was Tuatha de Danann, which means he is part of the mythical people who lived in Ireland prior to the arrival of the Celts. Uh, we know that there were people there, but what I sincerely doubt that they were a combination of gods, fairies, and giants. <laughs> um, Dagda Mor was one of the kings of the Tuatha de Danann. And his son, Angus of the Bru, was believed to have owned the lands of Bru, which is where Newgrange is, uh, which is, it's also why it is called, you know, uh, in the full Irish, it is uh, Bru na Boyne, because it's literally the Bru of the river. <laughs> uh, I love the, uh, uh, of Boyne. And so it is believed that this was, uh, that this was his son, Angus's land, and that this, you know, is how we get the name, is, you know, sort of the derivative there the next legend is a personal fun one um it is the conception of the hound of Cullain, cuchulain the uh national hero of ireland from mythology uh irish hercules uh he, he's a mythical hero and it's believed that his mother uh detch was visited by the tuatha god lou of the long spear at uh at Newgrange, uh, Lou, funny enough, is the god of the sun. Coming into new, coming into the womb of the moon, and creating a mythical hero. You so can solar see, eclipse. 
Yeah, you can kind of see how like they're incorporating what's there into the stories of myth, which is really common throughout the world. Yeah, it's very common, but it's it's, it's also very fun to see happen. Oh, uh, for sure, it's interesting to it's, see the incorporation, especially when it's not harmful because it's not taking away from who built it; it's adding significance to the place. Uh, and we come to my personal favorite, which is the myth of Anglus and Care. Uh, they were lovers who fled to Newgrange and lived as swans. Uh, their love was forbidden, and Angus had a uh, had a sort of fairy deal with the god of love, uh, of which also named Angus, <laughs> uh, that if he could identify Care from three hundred swans, also uh, maidens also turned into swans, the two of them could be together forever and no longer be hunted. Um, I believe Angus does, and uh, they live together as swans, safe from everyone at Newgrange. Which, fun fact, Newgrange is the nesting ground, or the wintering ground, sorry, for the Icelandic whooping swan. <laughs> so literally every winter there are just hundreds and hundreds of swans. That's awesome. In the area, it's just like, hmm, we have this mound with the light goes into, ah, the sun god uh may you know made love and created our you know the hero of darkness <laughs> oh you know there's all these swans here hey forbidden lovers hiding as swans at newgrange yay <laughs> it's 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 fun uh it's fun cultural additions to the site rather than the i thought it's just a fun parallel to the detrimental legends around stonehenge that are yeah. i think this is a really cool interesting case study too to look at two ancient stone structures and see how both they took place in similar situations in both ireland and england but then the different mythos surrounding them one and then two the different approaches in both tourism preservation and also just like modern day tourism I don't yeah, know. both have been threatened by a highway by the way yeah well but neither si neither island. site is happy about it <laughs> <laughs> What's with the highways, people? Jesus. Well, both are a short jaunt um, of about uh, about thirty to sixty minutes by uh, by car or bus uh, into the middle of nowhere, and um, that tends to create traffic on roads not made for uh, <laughs> to handle modern traffic. So people want to build new roads, uh, usually through the site, because you know what? We should pave paradise and build a parking lot because that's convenient. <laughs> Also, to yeah. be fair, it, it and I will give a slight nod to this, the site of Stonehenge is absolutely fucking massive because you've got the main nuclear site, which is fully preserved, but then around it in this massive radial is hundreds of thousands yeah. of artifacts that they find on a regular basis. Like, okay. there is nowhere you can go that will avoid site. Yeah, well, keep in mind, like, three three miles or five kilometers, there are hundreds of burials uh just in the ground there that you know it's the same with uh it's it's the same with uh newgrange and newgrange the is US. yeah newgrange is a part you know there's no douth and 35 other sites that are a part of newgrange that aren't newgrange proper just building anything is is involved um uh the unesco uh heritage page is very critical of the of the road uh to uh to uh new range maybe uh, they're very the next they're very critical episode. <laughs> they're very critical of it uh with good reason uh it does pass over in view of the site yeah yeah but is why stonehenge wanted to go underground any yeah. final thoughts here before we wrap up um you're ne never things. letting you do rocks uh as a subject again <laughs> don't take things from sites it's not aliens it's Deal never aliens. Home. But on that terrible bombshell, thank you guys for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below. If there's a topic you would like to see us talk about, please leave a comment down below. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future podcasts. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you in two weeks.